of Jesus Christ as recorded by the Apostle John, chapter 18, John chapter 18, beginning at verse 33. Some of you will recognize this as part of the same text I used for a message many months ago entitled Barabbasite. You remember me preaching about Barabbas? Well, this we're pulling out of the text that we used that day. Uh, we're pulling these few scriptures out because there's another point and another little item I would like to bring us to. John chapter 18, beginning at verse 33, and I wonder this afternoon, would we please stand in honor of the reading of God's Word? Do you know why we stand when we read, when we read the Scripture? Some people don't understand this. The Bible said that when Israel had come back into their land and they were prepared to rebuild the temple of Almighty God, which is the heart and the foundation of their faith, of the Jewish faith, that the priest arose and he began to read from the scriptures. And when he did, the Bible said that all of Israel stood to hear the scriptures being read because they loved God's word and they honored God's word. And, and it's like even the elderly stood, even those that were affirmed stood. I've had preachers say to me, Brother Morrow, why do you ask people to stand? Because they hear it on our tape. And they say, why do you ask people to stand when you read the scripture? I said, I'll tell you why. Because we honor the word of God. We honor the reading of the word of God. When you actually read aloud the holy scriptures, then it's time for the people of God to stand up and honor the word of God. Amen. So that's why we stand and the Word of God reads today, John chapter 18, verses 38, uh, 33 through 38. And today I read for you from the New King James Version. Then Pilate entered the praetorium again, called Jesus, and said to him, Are you the King of the Jews? Jesus answered him, Are you speaking for yourself about this? Or did others tell you this concerning me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight, so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. Pilate therefore said to him, Are you a king then? Jesus answered, You say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again to the Jews and said to them, I find no fault in him at all. Amen. Master, we love you. We thank you, God, for your precious, wonderful word. God, I just ask you, Lord, this day to help me to deliver this message that you've given me in a manner, God, that would bring honor to your name. Lord, allow your anointing to flow this afternoon like it's never flowed before. For, Lord, I already feel such a powerful presence of your spirit in this place, ready to confirm every word that this preacher is about to prophesy. Master, in the name of Jesus, I ask you, that you would touch the heart of every hearer, those in this building, those that will later hear this message by faith. Let them know that they hear the truth, and the truth alone is able to set them free. God grant it in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Praise God and amen. You may be seated. Glory to God. You may be seated. 
I'm going to turn this down just a notch because I don't want you all to be busting out your eardrums. Okay. There are many a well-meaning songwriter within the Christian community over the many years which have written songs that are theologically incorrect and even at times offensive to God and the very gospel of truth which he has purchased with his own blood through the person of the man Jesus Christ. One such example of this that I have looked at many times and I may have referred to it uh, in your presence before, the old song that says, I should have been crucified. I should have suffered and died. I should have hung on the cross in disgrace, but Jesus, God's Son, took my place. The reality this afternoon is that the author of this song, along with so many others, has failed to realize that the, uh, what the very purpose of sacrifice is. A sacrifice is offered in substitution. A sacrifice was something that could be sought out that was blameless, without blemish, infirmity, or defect, perfect in every visible way. And that sacrifice was offered in the place of one who was not perfect, who was indeed blemished, who was afflicted, who was infirm, and who was defective. That sacrifice was offered as a substitute. The Worthy being offered on behalf of, not in the stead of, the unworthy. Do you hear what I just said? The worthy being offered on behalf of the unworthy, not instead of the unworthy. If you killed the unworthy, you would have accomplished nothing because they did not meet the criteria for the sacrifice. Do you hear what I'm saying? So the song that says, I should have been crucified, I should have suffered and died, is to assume that you had the same criteria in your life of perfection and holiness and righteousness as Jesus Christ himself, so that if you died on the cross of Calvary, it would have accomplished the same thing. But the reality is you did not, I did not, we did not, and that is why Jesus Christ was offered in our sin. Hallelujah, as a substitute. Isaiah 53 and 5, the word of God declares, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. You see, he offered as the Lamb of God a substitute, a sacrifice. He was offered worthy before God. And to, to this afternoon, I'm preaching to you. Someone asked me earlier the title of my message. One word, very simple, worthy. Worthy. Sacrifice was instituted in the land of Egypt at the visitation of the death angel. The final plague that God visited upon a rebellious Pharaoh and his idolatrous nation. We find the story in Exodus 12, 1 through 14. But I want to read the first five verses of that chapter to you. Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, this month shall be your beginning of month. It shall be the first month of the year to you. So to all the congregation of Israel, speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth of this month, every man shall take for himself a lamb, according to the house of his father, a lamb for a household. Now listen to this. And if the household is too small for a lamb, let him and his neighbor next to his house take it according to the number of the persons, according to each man's need, 
You shall make your count. Woo! You don't know what's coming. I got some good stuff coming. According to each man's needs, you will make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish. A male of the first year, you may take it from the sheep or from the goat. Children, listen to me now. Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, was sufficient a sacrifice for the entire household of humanity. Hallelujah. God said in verse 4 to Moses and Aaron, he said, if the household is too small for the lamb, he said, then let them go next door and bring their neighbors in and keep bringing neighbors in until you've got enough people to justify playing that lamb. Hallelujah. But the Bible said Jesus Christ was crucified once and for all. Hallelujah. For the entire household of humanity because his Worthiness exceeded that of any little four-footed beast that the priests of Israel had ever brought into the Holy of Holies. Woo! Hallelujah! Brings brand new meaning to the scripture when Jesus said in Acts 1 and 8, But ye shall be witnesses, uh, excuse me, but ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, and in Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Jesus said the sacrifice that I have provided on Calvary was sufficient, not just for the Jews, not just for Judea, not just for Judea and Samaria, but oh my God, he said, it's good for everybody. Hallelujah. The entire household of humanity was brought in and covered by the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. My blessed Jesus. John 1, 29 through 35, the Word of God declares, The next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, after me comes a man who is preferred before me. He is more worthy. He is worthy. He is more than I am or could ever be. For he was before me. I did not know him, but that he should be revealed to Israel. Therefore I came baptizing with water. And John bore witness, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and he remained upon him. I did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, Upon whom ye see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen, John said, and testified that this is the Son of God. And the next day, John stood with two of his disciples, and looking at Jesus as he walked, he said, Behold the Lamb of God. Hallelujah. As Jesus stood before Pilate that day in John chapter 18, he made it clear to Pilate, For this cause was I born, and for this cause I have come into the world. Hallelujah. He knew what his purpose was. He knew why he was there. And as unfortunate as it may seem, his sacrificial death on the cross of Calvary was absolutely essential to the equation. But also essential to that equation was the words that Pilate uttered at the end of John 18, 38, when he declared, <laughs> oh, I'm telling you, I'm feeling so happy. When he said, I find no fault in him at all. I find no fault in him at all. The priest would take the lamb before it would go to sacrifice. And 
he would inspect it, and he would look it over, and he would look for blemish, and he would look for broken bones, and he would look for infirmities, and he would look for anything that might make that sacrifice unworthy for the altar. But my God, my children declare, I find no fault in him at all. Hallelujah. Woo! Glory. Why? Because he was worthy. He was worthy for the cross. Don't you degrade my Jesus by acting like he was done dirty on the cross of Calvary. He wasn't done dirty. He was worthy of the cross of Calvary. He was worthy to die there for me. Woo, Lord. Hasn't been another character in human history since the beginning of time. And there won't be one to come that'll ever be worthy as Jesus. First Peter 1, 17 through 21. And if you call on the Father, who without partiality judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in earth in fear, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your father's religion, good works. So Peter's talking about. He said, that's not what saved you. But with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, he indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest, 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 manifest in these last times for you who walk, uh, who through him believe in God who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Who is this lamb we call Jesus today, Curtis? Genesis 22 and 8. Abraham was speaking to his son Isaac, and Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. <laughs> Who was this lamb? Isaiah 9 and 6 said, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Hallelujah. Who was this lamb we call Jesus? Matthew 1, 23. Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Hallelujah. Who was this lamb we call Jesus? First Timothy 3, 16, Paul says, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. Who is this lamb we call Jesus? 2 Corinthians 5, 19. The word of God declares through the apostle Paul, to wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and has committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Who was this lamb we call Jesus? John 1 and 10, he was in the world, and the world was made by him. Him, singular, and the world knew him not. Who was this lamb we call Jesus? There are those that say, oh, but we don't believe. We believe the New Testament is a painted document. It's invalid. That's why we've reinterpreted the Bible and rewritten it because the New Testament is completely false. It was originally written in Hebrew and 
translated into Greek, and when it was translated into Greek, it was completely mistranslated and made to say things, and the divinity of Jesus Christ and the declaration of Jesus Christ as God was an invention of men after apostolic times, and that this is why in the Greek transcript we have the doctrine of Jesus Christ as God manifest in the flesh. Well, that's all right, honey, because i got news for you. The Old Testament lets us know good and plain and clear just as well as the new. Isaiah 35, 4 and 6, Say to them that are of a fearful heart, Be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, even God with a recompense. He will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then shall the lame man weep as in heart, and the tongue of the dumb shall sing glory to God. That verse sounds like a step-by-step -step account of the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ to me, doesn't it? In Matthew 11, 4 and 5, when John the Baptist wanted to know if Jesus Christ was who he thought he was, and he began to question and he wasn't sure, he sent his disciples to the Lord, and the Lord answered the disciples, saying, Jesus answered and said unto them, Go and show John again those things which ye do hear and see. The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached unto them. Jesus didn't even tell him who he was. He said, just go tell him what I'm doing. Because I already said that here in Isaiah 35 that when your God shows up on the scene, these are the things that will be happening. Woo, glory. My God, have mercy. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Hosea 13 and 4. Yes, I am the Lord thy God from the land of Egypt, and thou shalt know no God but me. For there is no Savior beside me. Isaiah 43, 11. I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. Isaiah 44, 6 through 8. Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. I am the first, and I am the last, and beside me there is no God. And who, as I shall call, and declare it, and set it in order for me, since I appointed the ancient people, and the things that are coming, and shall come, let them show unto them, fear ye not, neither be afraid, have not I told thee from that time, and, I, and have declared it. Ye are my witnesses. Is there a God beside me? Yea, there is no God. I know not any. Hallelujah. Isaiah 45, 6, uh, 5 and 6, as well as verse 21. I am the Lord thy God, and there is none else. There is no God beside me. I heard of thee, though thou hast not known me, that they may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none beside me. I am the Lord, and there is none else. Tell ye, and bring them near. Yea, let them take counsel together. Who hath declared this from ancient times? Who hath told it from that time? Have not I the Lord? And there is no God else beside me. A just God and a Savior, and there is none beside me. Who is this Lamb we call Jesus? He was our God from heaven, is who he was. The Jewish people to this day, from the very beginning of Christianity to this day, have rejected the notion that Jesus Christ was God. Because that is the only proposition they have ever heard put before them from the very onset of Christianity to this day. They have never heard it taught that Jesus Christ was not God, as some would try to teach you, 
that they're telling you the truth and the rest of us that preach the deity of Christ are a bunch of liars. But what they don't realize is that it was the notion that Jesus Christ was God that drove the Jews to crucify him. And from that day till this, that is the very notion that they refuse to accept. That this man could possibly have been God, manifest in human form. They fail to realize that Jesus Christ was none other than God himself, become the Lamb for all humanity, as Abraham had prophesied. Had the New Testament been rewritten, as some try to say, the singular and most central truth of biblical apostolic Christianity would remain steadfast and untouched. Jesus Christ would still be God because those in New Testament say the same thing. So you can be stupid and say, well, we don't accept the New Testament because we say that it was written a different way and blah, 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 and we're going to rewrite it so it says what we want it to say. But honey, i got news for you. The fact that you accept the Old Testament as legitimate finds yourself in hell. Because the Old Testament prophesied plain and clear that God himself would be the Savior of Israel and that none other, none other, was around him or by him or beside him to do the job. Whew. Revelation 5. What a gorgeous hunk of scripture this is. Listen. 1 through 13. John the Revelator writes, And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside, sealed with seven seals, and I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, <laughs> Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? And no man in heaven, nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders said unto me, Weep not, behold, whoo, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders, to the Lamb, as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them hearts and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayer of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, hallelujah, and hath made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. And I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne, and beasts and the elders, and the number of them was ten thousand times ten thousand and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, which is in heaven, 
and on the earth and under the earth, and such as are in the sea, and all that are in them, heard I say, Blessing and glory and honor and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne, and, and the word and here is kai, which literally can be translated, and in many places in the, the King James they do translate it as even. Be unto him that sitteth upon the throne, and unto the Lamb forever and ever. Do you know in the Old Testament prophets, God declares that my glory will I give not unto another. God said, I don't share my glory. It's either mine or it's nobody's. I don't share my glory. But the Bible tells us that this image of the Lamb that we behold in Revelation chapter 5. Now I hope y'all are smart enough to realize when you got a lamb that has seven horns and three eyes and this and that and all of that, that we're not talking about a literal animal. I hope you got enough sense to know that, don't you? We're talking about a figurative pictorial image that God used in the Revelation so that, it, that John could understand how that God took on a form and became the Lamb and became the worthy Lamb that was sacrificed for humanity. And in so doing, he won all the believers from every kindred, every tribe, every nation, every tongue, all of this unto God. He won them unto himself. But how did he do it? As God? No, as the Lamb. And we read further in Revelation that God and the Lamb sit in the same throne. Don't sit beside one another. Of course we don't. You know why? Because they're the same. You see, in the book of Revelation, when it describes the great horror of Revelation, in Revelation 19, it's not talking about a real horror, a real woman, for God's sake. It's talking about an organization. So when he speaks of the Lamb in the book of Revelation, he's not talking about a literal figure, a literal person. He's talking about the medium whereby he redeemed mankind, the sacrifice of the sacrificial Lamb that was offered. Revelation 7, 9 through 14. And these things I looked and beheld in a great multitude, which no one could number, of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne, and or even to the Lamb. All the angels stood around the throne, and the elders and the four living creatures, and fell on their faces before the throne, and worshiped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom, thanksgiving and honor and power and might, be to our God forever and ever, Amen. Then one of the elders answered, saying to me, Who are these arrayed in white robes, and where did they come from? And I said to him, Sir, you know. So he said to me, These are the ones who come out of the great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Hallelujah. Revelation 22 and 1. And he showed me a pure river of water, of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Not the one throne. Do you hear me? It says, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. There's one throne. And there's two figures, as it were, that occupy the two personalities as our God and our Redeemer, the Lamb. 
which is none other than our God. Worthy today is the title of my message. Jesus Christ died on the cross of Calvary. It was not an injustice. It was the greatest justice ever visited on humanity. The greatest, most wonderful event that ever could have happened. Because nobody else could have filled his shoes. Nobody else could have done what he did. Nobody else was worthy. But look at the declaration of the angels and of the elders in the book of Revelation as they declare, Worthy is the Lamb. Hallelujah. Just picture them up there in heaven shouting at the top of their lungs, Worthy is the Lamb to open the book. Hallelujah. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb. He died because he was worthy of that death. He was crucified because he was worthy of that crucifixion. Oh, hallelujah. He was sacrificed because he was worthy as our sacrifice. Pilate wasn't the only one who looked upon him that day and declared, I find no fault in him at all. But God himself looked upon that human form, the humanity, and knew there was no sin there. There was no imperfection there. There was nothing improper. There was nothing defective. There was nothing at all that would disqualify this sacrifice for humanity. And it's interesting because before man fell, the Bible said God used to come into the garden and walk with Adam and Eve. You remember? And the day before Jesus was crucified, God came down to humanity and walked in the garden once again. But the garden was called Gethsemane. <laughs> and he walked in that garden and he talked with humanity just like he did in the Garden of Eden. Said, well, this is where it all broke down. This is where it all went sour. This is where I'm going to make it all right. <laughs> Amen. God had come down once again and was walking in the midst of us as he had with Adam and Eve in, in, in the book of Genesis. And he's worthy. God did not create a sacrifice, my friends. You hear me? That's a false doctrine and it's a lie from hell. God did not create a sacrifice that was worthy. Uh-uh. No, God became the sacrifice. And that is why the sacrifice was worthy because of who it was. <laughs> Who is you following me today? Isn't that exciting? When you know who was this feet on our Who glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Glory. When you realize who was in that body, then you realize, <laughs> you realize why that sacrifice was worthy. You realize why that sacrifice was without blemish. You realize why that sacrifice could have Pilate stand over it and say, I find no fault at all in him. He said, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus said, well, what do you, do you say that for yourself or are you repeating what you heard other people say? But you notice he didn't deny it. He went on to say, well, this is the reason that I came. To be honest with you, that's the reason that I've come to be the king. That's the whole reason I'm here. You know why? Because when the people of Israel wanted a king, God said, I want to be your king. I don't want you to have a potentate like other nations do. I don't want you to have a king like the Philistines do or like the, the people of Babylon do. I want to be your king. And I will speak to you directly through my prophets and through my judges and through my priests. But the people of Israel said, no, no, we want a king, we want a king. So God gave them Saul. That was their first king. And then King David. But then the promise came that Messiah would become, he would be of David's lineage. And that of his kingdom there would be no end. Why? Because he's God, darling. Because God himself was doing what he needed to do to be Israel's king. Because that's what he wanted from the get-go, and that's what he said he was going to do, and he did it. 
He didn't simply inherit his kingdom. He purchased his kingdom. But he could never have paid the price if he weren't worthy. But because of who he was, he was worthy. Worthy the Lamb. Praise the name of the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. The Lord, we just love you. We thank you, God, for this service. We thank you, God, for another opportunity to be in the house of God. Lord, you you just pulled everything out of me today that I had to give. I need strength in my body now to recover, but we thank you for this wonderful anointing and presence and power of God we felt in this place today. King Jesus, we love you. We just thank you, God. Lord, I just humble myself in your presence at this moment. For God, I just feel such a wonderful power and presence and anointing of the Holy Ghost in this place. And Lord, I don't want to rush away from it. Hallelujah. God, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, praise God, Lord, you're worthy, you're worthy, you're worthy, you're worthy, you're worthy, you're worthy. Praise God, amen, Jesus. You're worthy, Lord, you're worthy. Thank you, God. Master, take this word today, we pray. And Lord, bring it to life in the hearts of everyone that's heard it. Lord, there are many who are going to hear this message by tape at a later date. And we just ask God that you would just speak to their hearts as well. Let them be liberated by the truth and the knowledge of Jesus Christ and the identity of our God. Lord, this day we pray, we, God, that you would just move through your word, send forth your word, and heal them this hour. Whatever their false conceptions, whatever false doctrine they may have embraced at one time, Lord, just restore them and repair them at this hour to know the truth, to grab hold of it, God, in the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God and amen.